What's the first thought that pops into your head when you think of the Kings Park Psychiatric Center? Um, home. They claw, scratch, and breathe heavy. I guess they just can't keep it a secret. They watching me while I'm sleeping. While I'm fighting these demons, they just come in and they beat them. I take four, I take freedom. While I'm high on the bike, get it, smoke a pipe, or I'm siphoning. And I yell, scream like a Viking, and I'm cycling fast. I'm a. I know it sounds strange, but uh, I grew up in Kings Park, and uh, you know, it, it was always a part of our lives because everybody worked there. It was the glue that kept the community together. And what I mean by that is that everybody worked there. And so uh, someone may be your supervisor as you work there, but they may be your next door neighbors and your kids hung out and they played together and there were softball teams and all sorts of uh, activities you did. There was a CSEA, which was the local union that had all different types of activities. You know, the psychiatric center yeah. was the cornerstone of our town. So Uh, if I'm kind of down in the dumps and I start thinking about Kings Park, I think about the stuff that which is depressing. If I'm in an average day or whatever, good mood, then I'm thinking about the good things that happened here. My first thought is like I, I have some good memories and, and, and it, it kind of breaks my heart to see where it is now. Something should have been done with it. The, 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 the basically, uh, the state abandoned it completely. This, this place could have been utilized in a much, much better way instead of letting it just fall down on itself. You know? I just, it, it kind of breaks my heart. It's, it's kind of melancholy. It, it's, 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 it brings back memories could have come here. But it also it, it, it's also sad to come here because I I haven't been in the buildings. I don't know what they look like. I just see pictures, and it just sort of breaks my heart, you know, because uh, I remember what it used to look like, and I know we worked very hard to keep it in in a state where it was it was nice and clean and and pleasant to come to. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, I started working there. I worked there for a couple of years when I was in high school. In fact, it was my very first job. Mm -hmm. And I worked in an area called the uh, community store. It was where both patients and staff went. It was like a deli and like a uh, grocery store. It was mm -hmm. like an all-in-one store. And uh, I really enjoyed it because I felt like, um, you know, I really made a difference. It's my favorite job to this day because mm -hmm. that just talking to a patient, uh, you began to learn more about their lives, and we had a lot of fun too. Like, I went to school here, got my RN for only eight hundred bucks. And I met my wife here. We married forty-seven years. It was interesting. All the classes were in Building Seven. School of nursing was on the second and third floor. The rest of it was all med surge. And since we're nurses, that's where we did a lot of our training. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, one thing I became proficient at was inserting catheters. My, uh, my, my, uh, my fiance at the time, and now my ex-wife, was uh, working for an agency, an outside agency, and she had to come here for some paperwork to do something here. And while we were here, and I rode with her, and I, I just, you know, she says, you know, she, we suggested maybe I'll just put in an application. You know, had nothing to, you know, nothing to lose. Uh, I worked here from 1981 to the day it closed, right? um, and I worked uh, the ITU unit at a maximum security unit. We called it, but it was I was a, a secure care treatment aid or SCTA. 
I was a, I was a bus boy, a short order cook. <laughs> that was okay. a, you know, I worked my way up from being a bus boy to a short order cook. And uh, to this day, I could crack 12 eggs in like two seconds mm. with two hands without breaking a yolk. No problem. Awesome. You know, it's one of those skills you yeah. keep with you for life. And you serve both patients and workers. Yeah, patients and staff. Um, and uh, the patients were on one side of the, of the community store and the staff was mm -hmm. on the other side. And it was segregated in that way, but they bought the same food, the same, they came up to the same counters. Um, but the patients weren't allowed to have money because uh, money was, uh, it wasn't good for that because a lot of other things went on with money on the wards and stuff. And so what they had was what we called a community card. Uh, their, um, their family would put money on the card, like an account, or some of them had jobs in the psychiatric center. And that was always mm -hmm. a good thing because uh, jobs, we could talk about that a little bit later, but having purpose for life is very important. But they would have jobs and they would get very small wages, but enough to spend it in the store. So they would come in with the community store with their store card, they would buy goods, we would take a look at how much is on there, they would put it in the machine, we would, we would put it in the cash register, then it would count it up and then give a balance. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's how we did it with the patients. It was a great experience because some of the people I worked with were, were patients. And, uh, and that's very critical because that and it's very important in the development of the patients because that uh, people mean meaning for life. In the same way, it was meaningful for me to get up and go to work. Even though I had school, I had to show up. It's the same thing with a psychiatric patient because in the end, they're people. They are, they're mm -hmm. us and we are them. And so the ability to have to get up, go to work was very meaningful for them and a big part of their, uh, their growth. Uh, in the old days, the patients were required to work. And so because it was a farm, it, there were no stores, there were, weren't even electricity. They had their own power plant on the psychiatric center. Mm -hmm. So all the patients that could work, worked. They worked in the laundry, they worked preparing food, they worked on the grounds of the institution, and how the institution stayed in, in business, or at least ran itself. It was a self-sustaining community. And actually, the community grew up around it. If you mm -hmm. take a look at the King's Park, that's how it got its name. If you take a look at the uh, psychiatric center, it was originally uh, part of what they call the Kings County Assane Asylum. That was in uh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn is Kings County. And when the Brooklyn facility got so full that they couldn't expand anymore, they decided to create an annex. So they created out here in farmland, which was then Smithtown, or referred to as St. John Land. And uh, so they start to call it the Kings County Park Asylum, or annex, the Kings County Park Annex. And so after a while, it got abbreviated to Kings Park, Kings Park. And that's how we actually got the name of it. Well, started as a ward personnel, assistant therapy aide, and then therapy aide. Then I got my RN, and they assigned me to a ward in 93. I was on 35, that's on the 10th floor, this side. Mm -hmm. And see, that was in sea service. And I thought all I'd do is be an RN on the ward. No. I started in September as an RN. I think in October I walked in and they said, said you're it. I had the building. I didn't know diddly squat what to do. Uh, I got a crash court course in administration. Basically, if something came up I didn't know what to do with, I called a nurse administrator in another building. And they would either tell me what to do or they'd come over and handle it. Uh, most of the things I had no problem with. Then I became a nurse too. 
I still had Ward 35, but then I basically became a rounds person, which meant if the boss was off, or if he didn't feel like doing anything, I took over the service, which was what? I just made sure every ward was staffed and uh, did some quick paperwork and that was it. Then I go up to my ward and if anybody needed me they called me on the ward. Uh, I started off as a cleaner. Uh, yeah, it, it, to, to get into this place all you had to do was get your foot in the door in some place in some way. Uh, so I found a way to get in that way. I just tried it, and then uh, my first my first detail actually was in Building 15. I worked in Building 15 as a housekeeper, a cleaner, right, and, uh, sweeping floors and mopping floors and stuff like that, and cleaning windows. And then um, I think it was Ward 62. I think Ward 62. It was. Uh, and then um, I stayed there for about a month, maybe a little bit more than a month. Because I remember, I started in October, and I remember being there through Christmas. Right? Because I remember looking out the window, mm -hmm. right? And they would dress up the grounds for Christmas. The first time I got on the ward, I never saw anything like it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I was 24 years old. I was engaged. I was getting. I was planning on getting married, and uh, <clears throat> I walked onto this ward, and I'd never seen anything so, never think so, so anything like it. It was, you walk, you open the door, and I'll never forget it. It was like, you stuck the key in the door, right? And it was like something out of an old horror movie when you open the door because you actually heard the door you heard the key go click clunk when you open it mm -hmm. right and then when you open the door it actually creaked right right but you were doing you were opening the door it wasn't like it was opening by itself and then I locked it I closed it behind me and I went clunk clunk and I was like it just you know it gave me a little chill mm -hmm. and I have to say I mean for the first five days or so I was thinking I don't know if I could do this because it seems so spooky so so eerie um, but I did stick it out you know I eventually did you know um, the ward the ward I was on the the room was so big so cavernous and stuff like that the patients were basically uh, you know they, they'd walk around freedom you know they walk around do what they want to do and stuff like that at the time they were smoking on the ward so they were smoking and they were always bugging you up for, uh, hitting you up for cigarettes if you have a cigarette you have a cigarette or um, <clears throat> the, the most unusual thing I saw because I after that I really didn't see any after that when I after I left that building I saw patients that uh, they had lobotomies mm -hmm. I, they had some lobotomy patients over there um, yeah, they were very docile and they were very but they were they were kind of like uh, blank you know there was uh, what we, we call like a, almost an, uh, a flat effect or something like that where they just sit there like uh, and they would they were almost they would repeat what you tell them. To, they would do exactly what you tell them to do, or they were, you know, they would repeat what you do. I remember they, Christmas was coming around, and they, they had one guy singing Christmas songs, and they taught him how to sing Christmas songs, and he just, they just tell him, sing a Christmas song, and he sing a Christmas song, just like that, you know. I mean, the day went uneventful and stuff like that. It was pretty good. I mean, there, there were days when the patients would act out, and being a being a housekeeper, I wouldn't get involved. That wasn't my that wasn't my job. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but yeah, I I stayed there for about maybe a month, maybe a little bit more, and then I moved on to building one. Fifteen was medium term. 
In other words, if they came out of admissions and they were needed further care, they would go to 15 a lot of times. They were younger, more active. So the employees were younger. So, you know, if anything happened, they would react a hell of a lot quicker than I, an employee my age would. Uh, matter of fact, I saw one patient get up, started to yell and scream at another patient, and started to run at him, and the employee tackled him. I mean, you know, right around the chest. As he tackled him, he rolled and went down on the ground. The employee hit the ground first with the patient on top of him. And he just kept the roll going onto the floor until he was on his back. And, you know, by then somebody got a straight jacket and they were putting him in it. It was like a ballet almost. The way you just, you know, sometimes watching football, you see it just hit right, mm -hmm. and they both go down. That's happened. That's what it looked like. But most of the patients in 15, they were pretty well medicated. You know, at that time, we had medications that actually worked. What medications? Well, Thorazine, Melaril, Stelazine, Prolixin. Uh, these were the biggies. To employee about 15, he'd been there for years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he was an RN. And he said they used to have Thorazine in gallon jugs. And the mattresses on the beds, they all had straps on one side. You'd hear the siren go off on the firehouse, a very short, loud whoop, whoop, whoop. He said, that's when everyone went to 15, all extra male employees. First thing they did was grab the mattresses, and the straps were there so they could hold the mattress in front of them. Two to each mattress, two employees, and they'd push the patients up against the wall and hold them there. Nurse would go along with the syringes, fill it, Thorazine in the leg. And just go right down the line. And what would happen to cause the firehouse siren to go off to where they would have to do that? Uh, could have been a patient fight. Uh, every once in a while the patients would get together and try to get out. And the only way to get out was to grab a set of keys which meant getting on an employee. Building 22, ITU. I personally liked it because it was different from any of the other wards. We, we had our own, it was our own unit. We were isolated from the other, other units. We ran differently. Uh, we operated differently. Uh, we had our own rules and we had our own security. We, we you know, we, 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 had, um, we had the place pretty well secure. Because the patients were uh, on record were had a history of violent outbursts or uh, violent behaviors, and ITU was it was intended for um, how to say as it says intensive treatment unit. Mm -hmm. It was intended for a, per, a patient would have a uh, an episode of violent uh, episode or something like that, and then uh, they'd bring them to us, and we try and find out why they had that violent episode or what happened, what made them, mm -hmm. you know, trip up like that. And then uh, we'd finally, uh, you know, we, we try and uh, fix the problem, try and, you know, get them to a point where they can be manageable again and everything else, and eventually we send them right back to their wards again. You know, there was some that never did leave, though. Mm -hmm. Some because their history was so bad that they ended up staying with us. The, the store was, was a wonderful place because I, I only dealt with the highest functioning patients. Those are patients who are allowed out of the wards. And uh, some patients weren't allowed out because they couldn't take care of themselves or uh, they wouldn't respond. Uh, at the end of the day, a bell would ring, a big horn.
and that everyone would have to return back to the wards. And so there were certain rules that the patients had to follow in order to be out. So my experience with the patients was very, very, very positive. Almost all the patients were very well behaved. Um, and there were all different types. Uh, you, you got to know people very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, no one was, everyone's former life was, they're either a rocket scientist or an astronaut or a, or a Broadway dancer. No one was a regular person. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that was always very fun, listening to the stories. I mean, most of them were all fabricated, but, uh, but it, was, it was a lot of fun listening to the patients. And uh, I remember one fellow we used to call the professor. He would march up and down the road in these suits that, uh, that the staff would, would give him. And he would act like he's talking to a judge, giving this doctoral dissertation, and like he's in la la land, and you're like, this guy's out of his mind. And he would just, but harmless, but he would just be talking like he's talking to a judge. And then some of the guys would say, you want to play cards? And say, oh, okay, and come back and he'll play cards, just talk and be regular. And then after he was done, he would go into his lawyerly thing. There were a lot of very odd, odds the wrong way, but, uh, but there were a lot of, lot of things like, like that that were very, uh, very interesting and endearing. You know, most of the patients, they all had families, and uh, some of the patients were very happy to be there because, uh, you know, you take a look at uh, the way some of the things are going on now with people on the street. A lot of those people, if they weren't in the asylum, uh, in the hospital, in the psychiatric mm -hmm. center, they would be on the street. General people who couldn't take care of themselves, who had drug problems or other problems, and as soon as they were on their own, they just went down this downward spi spiral. So the psychiatric center gave them the ability to uh, to better manage their lives, and so mm -hmm. uh, and so the patients that I was there with were very, very, very well, um, very well managed or behaved. You mentioned that you had a serial killer as your Patient. Yeah, I can't mention. I won't mention his name on camera. All That's right. It's okay. You, you know? don't have to if you all want right? to talk. Yeah, but know. yeah, he was. We we had a couple of them. Mm -hmm. We we had a serial killer there. Um, the only thing I can tell you is this, because I sat in a room with him, across the table from him, and we had conversations. He was one of my. He was one of my one of the patients that I dealt with directly. The nicest mildest, meekest man you would ever want to meet. You would never know. Never, ever know. But in talking to him, because the state was after him because he was trying to get a release, uh, I got a chill up, up and down my spine like I never got with any other patient. Never got any other patient. Because every time he go out, he go and uh, he try he try to get a release, or he try to he try to uh, petition the court to be released. He would uh, somebody would come out, uh, the, somebody would come out and say that he uh, he attacked him in some way or something like that. And uh, and then I remember the DA asking him. He said that the DA had asked him if he. You know, if you, are there any others? Do you remember anything like that? And he says, I honestly don't know. And I remember telling him, I says, listen, I'm sorry, but uh, it's a valid question. It really is. It's a valid question. I, I can't deny it. It's a valid question. He says, well, Bob, I, I really don't know. I really don't know. At that moment, I could tell he was either blotting it out of his head or he wasn't going to admit it for any other reason. All right, and then I just saw the the malevolence in him, the, the 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 evil coming out of him. All right, and it was he was just trying to hide, and he wasn't trying to be real. He wasn't trying. To... I remember one time, in admissions. We had a patient come in. He was admitted, 18 year old. He was a contender for the Golden Gloves Championship for the state. This kid didn't have an ounce of fat on him, and every single muscle was defined. He wasn't Schwarzenegger type, but every muscle was, you could see it. Mm -hmm. uh, 
He went off the wall after he was admitted that night. I went up to the ward, and at that time, I think I weighed about 270. I got on, he was on his back on the floor, and two girls were trying to hold down his left arm. So I just went there, being heavier. What the heck? Put my weight on it, held him down. I swear to God, that kid was lying on his back. He just took his arm with me on it, 270 pounds, and went like that. He lifted me. He was in a full-blown psychotic episode. The strength that they exhibited was unbelievable. The only problem is it puts tremendous strain on the body. And unfortunately, he died. He just collapsed. We couldn't bring him back. We kept him going and had the ambulance take him to St. John's. They worked on him for about an hour. 18 years old and that was it. I'm living proof that mental illness is contagious. The only thing is you don't get it off the kids. You get it from the employees and patients. That patient I just described, that happened in 86. And I was the supervisor on call on, in the building. I responded to it. I was there uh, when he collapsed, got the employees together, got a nurse doing CPR. Uh, got the ambulance and whatnot, shipped them out. Anyway, the doctor had to call the family and tell them, I'm sorry, but your son passed away. And I guess that was the straw that broke the camel's back with me. Uh, nothing happened then. But over the years, going back into the building, I became more and more depressed. Until 96 when I, one night I went in there, went straight up to the assistant director's office and said, I can't work, I'm going home. I put in for a leave and they uh, granted it. I was out for about a year, and nothing improved. Still depressed. And I had to finally say that was it, I couldn't work there. So I went on re disability retirement. Unfortunately, that only gave me one third pay. I tried to get you know, work-related, but it was hard to prove. PTSD was just becoming something. And it turned out that's what I had. And it took about five or six years until they finally found a medication that worked for me. So now I'm the bright and shiny personality you see before you. No longer depressed. I mean, um, at least here, you know, we were just told, all right, we're going to be closing, we're going to be leaving, they're closing the hospital, we're moving to Pilgrim, and, and that would be it. And there was some trepidation about that. Like some people said, no, I don't want to go, we don't go, you know, but, you know, you sat and thought about it. Well, if you didn't go, and you had that option, if you didn't want to go, you didn't have to go, but then you would have to quit. All right? So then, what do you do? You've been on the same job 10, 15 years, right? And now you're going to quit? And the problem is you're working for the state. You have a pension plan. You leave it. You're screwing yourself. 
because now uh, you can't collect on that pension. You cannot collect on it until you reach the age of 55. No matter when you leave, you can't collect on it. There was a, there was a window there where you had to do, you had to get vested first. All right. I think at the time it was when I when I started it was five years and then contracts changed and everything else and I think they went to five years after vesting, but uh, after that. Uh, you know, most of us just went over to Pilgrim. You know, most of us did. Mm -hmm. You know, so it 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 was just that it was it was really different because you know what you work. I worked in maximum security ward where we were we were locked in. Matter of fact, to get to my ward, you had to go through two doors. Two doors. And then you had the and and every other door, every other door or exit to the ward, which was on the on the fourth floor in twenty two, you had two doors to get in and out. There was the fire escape, which actually had two doors, three if you count the one downstairs, and then there's the courtyard, which had two doors. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, that's why it was. That was one of the reasons why we called it maximum security unit. You know, because mm -hmm. uh, no other no other ward in the hospital was set up like that. You know, we had mm -hmm. we had the um, we had the security. We had a we actually had a hallway, a, a foyer way where there was one door, then a second door, and then. Um, and then we had like three rooms in that area and we used them for visiting. We used them for visiting and then uh, the, the inmates, no, not the inmates, the, the sheriffs would use, it, use one room as their office. You know, mm -hmm. so, um, and so, so, you know, it, it gave a measure of security that you couldn't find anywhere else. And that's why I think that's why they they you had utilized that one mm -hmm. so much. It was it was secure. There was no no other way to explain it. You know, it really was secure compared to the other ones because all some a lot of these wards they were open during the day, and some of these wards weren't open during the day. Ours was closed twenty four seven, six seven you know, three hundred sixty five days a week. You could not walk off that water on that ward without an escort or somebody with you. Mm -hmm. so that, that's that's the way we ran it we, and we liked it that way too so it was kind of hard leaving here and going to a different unit a different place and um, you know just just everything was different you know everything was just different because the security wasn't just it wasn't just for the patients and the public it was also we felt safe being that way too even though we were locked in with them you know we had each other's backs and we know what was going on you know? um, but for the most part I mean it was it was a pretty good gig it was a pretty good time uh, everybody uh, co-workers got pretty tight with each other we got to know each other pretty well and stuff like that we worked very closely together and mm -hmm. uh, and we became friends a lot I still talk to someone you know, um, and and I, like I said, when we left, it was like it's like an end of an era, and then we had you know we had a change, and then and when we were in Pilgrim, we moved around a little bit, till we finally got our own unit and uh, our own our own ward in, in Building Eighty Two over there. But uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah. For, for many years, uh, when it was closed down, I guess in 96, mm -hmm. uh, myself and many people in the communities, we worked to have the uh, psychiatric center repurposed to maintain some of the buildings. And to like, there were plans about having a uh, YMCA, they used to have an old rec center where they had pools and uh, 
and uh, or to have like condos or other ways of uh, colleges or mm -hmm. other ways of using the building. York Hall was this beautiful hall that was like a all-purpose center and we really wanted that open to be a catering hall or you know we used it as for basketball games and youth center. There were so many things we wanted to use it for but in the end uh, none of this came to pass. It was very easy to spend other people's money. And these things have to be budgeted, and there are reasons why uh, the state chose what they did. You know, United States of Stevie Weber would have been done differently. <laughs> and at times, we're very bitter about this because it was a major part of the community, and it's a wonderful resource. And we just didn't want low-income housing or any housing there. It's a beautiful park, and we wanted it to be reflective of not only the history, but to perhaps return to open space and and to, to reuse the center. But mm -hmm. it just went into a state of disrepair and it got to the point where where none of the buildings could be used again. The government is very good and it's very bad at times. And mm -hmm. it's a reflection of us because we're very good and very bad. And so and so it's very easy to like think of all the alternative uses and I would have liked some of them to come to pass, but so many of them didn't and the risk to the community from having the old buildings there. As years go by, it gets worse and worse. And you certainly wouldn't want anyone to hurt themselves or have rescuers hurting themselves, saving anybody. I know. But uh, so, so we would like some type of long-term uh, solution to the area. But having it as a park now, I think it's wonderful. I really love it. I love open space. I go out hiking every day. And uh, I just love, I, I love it there. And, uh, and I'd like to see, like they have uh, uh, soccer fields. I'd like to see bathrooms and a concession stand. I'd like to see more baseball fields. I'd like to see some of the formerly developed areas return back to uh, nature. Uh, there are deer all over, there's foxes. It's, it's mm -hmm. great, it's great. And so all in all, what ends well, ends well. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's been a long road and uh, I'm glad there's not housing there and I'm glad it's being used as a park. There have been missed opportunities, but there's no use crying over spilled milk, you know? Yeah. We're, we're, we're doing good, and I, the state's been doing a great job. I mean, really, you know, it's very easy to be critical of the state, but uh, in my opinion, they're doing a wonderful job. You know, with the money they have, the resources they have, they have a whole park system to run. Kings Park isn't their only park, and they have to, you know, allocate the funds ac accordingly. But it's great. And also, I hear the DEC is setting up an administration center there, and they're going to create a new building. And that's wonderful, mm -hmm. you know. Get some jobs into the community. Uh, the DEC is great. What a wonderful opportunity for the high school to have students intern there, or Suffolk Community College, and uh, mm -hmm. all these are good things. I think, you know, all in all, for me, everything's marching, marching in the right direction. It should have been utilized for something else. It should have been utilized. Maybe they had the outpatient, and I think they should have kept that. Mm -hmm. At least an outpatient thing. Um, the reason why it closed, because the mindset changed in the, in the politics of uh, OMH, and also the state... From, from almost from the day I started working, I was hearing how the state wanted to get out of mental health. They wanted to get out of mental health care because it was just a losing battle and they, and they were losing money at it. And uh, so the idea was to downsize everything, get rid of, you know, close all these built facilities and uh, stop pouring money into them to keep them running. Uh, I always felt that, that that was a waste. These buildings have been here for a hundred, some of them for a hundred years, all right? And I think they should, it should have been utilized in some other way. Uh, there were rumors while I was working here that developers were coming on the, on the grounds and looking over the grounds and seeing what they could do with the buildings and stuff like that. There was actually a rumor going around that Donald Trump was actually running around these grounds a little bit, just looking around, you know, he, he was on the grounds and trying to decide whether he could develop it or not. You know? mm -hmm. Like this building here, we, th we this would have been a great co-op or condominium or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it could have been converted. It could have been it could have been done to something else. And but instead, the state is notorious for waste. It was it was kind of an ongoing joke that every time they would put a new roof on a on a building or re-venerate it, they would close it up. They close it up, and they would never use it again. 
why would you fix a building if you didn't intend to use it again? Mm -hmm. All right? Waste. Absolute waste. I heard stories about when uh, the storehouse was operating and stuff like that. We got, a, we got a, uh, an allotment of supplies every month. What you didn't use, right, went to the dump. Good or bad, went to the dump. Because if you didn't utilize the stuff that you had, you wouldn't get the same amount of supplies the next month. That's, a, I mean, that was just a story that I had heard, mm -hmm. right? I never physically actually saw it, but that's the story that I had heard, right? Waste was rampant here, absolutely waste. It was, this place was mismanaged because it was, um, it was run by government. It was run by uh, the state government, and uh, there was there's misman there's been there was mismanagement everywhere here. So um, it's sad. It really is. Uh, these buildings should have been saved. They should they should have done something with them. Uh, I still think you can, but I, I I'm not a structural engineer, so I I don't know. I mean, they're still standing here, so I don't see why you can't do something with them. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen buildings older than that. that used to uh, that 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 are still standing they you know a little work I wouldn't say they, these guys need a these need a lot of work but still and the architecture you don't find architecture like this anymore mm -hmm.